from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Carolyn Brown. I direct the Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center here at the library. And I'm delighted to welcome you here this afternoon for a presentation by Kelly Groom entitled The Quiet People, a Memoir. Um, before we begin, just a reminder, if you would, to turn off any cell phones or other electronic equipment um, that might go off during the presentation and disturb our speaker or the recording. Uh, this event is being sponsored by the John W. Kluge Center, which was established in the year 2000 with a very generous donation from John W. Kluge to create a scholarly venue on Capitol Hill where it would be possible, at least for mature scholars, to have informal conversations with some of the nation's leaders. The idea was to bring together the world of affairs and the world of ideas um, for um, possibly enriching conversation. When it happens, it's really quite wonderful. Um, but in addition, um, we also provide a research space for some of the world's most promising junior fellows um, to come together to do their research. And together it forms a, I think, pretty vital and interesting uh, community of scholars. Um, we expect, I started to say hope, but I'll just say expect that um, our junior fellows will in time become the great scholars of the future. Um, in addition to providing research opportunities, the center also, um, for those fellows who are at the postdoctoral level, um, we also offer, have them provide lectures about their work. Um, occasionally we do conferences and other kinds of seminars. You can go to the library's webpage, and I see we have the front of it right there. Um, on the right-hand side, I'm not going to try to scroll down, but on the right-hand side, um, you can click on Kluge Center and find out more about upcoming events. Uh, this afternoon's speaker is Kelly Groom, who is the Black Mountain Kluge Fellow at the Library of Congress. Um, this is a unique fellowship that ena enables a scholar or writer selected jointly by the Black Mountain Institute at the University of Nevada and the Library of Congress uh, to uh, spend time at each institution conducting research and writing. Um, the Black Mountain Institute um, is an international literary center dedicated to promoting discourse on today's most pressing issues. It provides an environment where creative writers and scholars can fight against entrenched perspectives, whatever their political or cultural source. Um, I think it would be fair, as you hear Kelly, to say she certainly is in that camp for sure. Um, Kelly was selected as this year's fellow. Um, she's been writing a memoir. Um, I think it's a somewhat unusual memoir, at least based on her proposal, it was quite unusual. One that incorporates private and public history, national and international history, rolls through several centuries of time and several ancestral strands. Um, I think many of you know that Kelly is a quite accomplished writer. She's published three books of poetry, Underwater City in 2004, Luckily in 2006, which was a Florida's poetry series selection, and Five Kingdoms in 2010. She's also published numerous poems, quite a long list in literary magazines, given innumerable poetry readings, served as a judge on poetry competitions, um, and received other multiple awards and honors. Um, although, of course, when she was applying for this fellowship, I had a chance to read her vita and read her proposal uh, as part of the selection process, um, my real window into um, Kelly's vision and sensibility uh, came from a wonderful review in the New York Times Sunday Book Review in August 2011. Um, and there, Madge McKeithen reviewed her first book of nonfiction, I Wore the Ocean in the Shape of a Girl, um, a review that described a memoir um, that had been, I would say, wrestled out of painful experience 
but with great honesty, insight, and a capacity to surprise. Um, I not only wanted to read the, read the book, um, although I haven't done that yet, I confess, but also to meet the soulful woman who had written it. Um, this afternoon, Kelly is going to speak about her current project, um, this memoir, um, her research, and her reflections on writing poems and writing memoirs. And I think she's also going to do some reading from her work. So you can be sure that in the future years you will hear more about Kelly Groom. So please welcome her. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to the Kluge Center and the Library of Congress um, and Black Mountain Institute. I came here uh, to do four months of research before I leave for Black Mountain at the University of Nevada, where I'll be writing for the next five months. Um, but here, I've had extraordinary um, access to extraordinary resources through the Kluge Center, and I leave with a wealth of material to work with. Um, thank you to the Kluge Center staff for their kind support, beautiful workplace, and for bringing together such a wonderful group of writers and scholars. The title of my project, The Quiet People, is taken from an art installation by Rayo Kayla of nearly 1,000 human figures beside a highway in northern Finland near Kusumo. Inspired by this installation and my own work, the title references my ancestors and those who left little to no written record, the challenge to make their lives visible, and the search to understand how my life connects to theirs. I'm working to incorporate private and public history in a structured, lyrically structured narrative, as Carolyn said, that examines the lives of Finnish, Irish, and Wampanoags in three towns in Massachusetts, beginning in the early 18th century. While I'm just beginning to write this book, the elements I'm interested in include the search to find these individuals and related subjects of land, home, fear, uncertainty, concerning, concerning war, mortality, among other concerns. And my aim is to, to look at these concerns through the lens of my ancestors' lives and my own. In my first memoir, my subject was uh, grief. And I began to write about grief using the vocabulary of shoemaking and shoes. In The Quiet People, my subject um, is fear. And my way into this book is through the lives of my ancestors. I'm interested in the movement between writing, poems, and memoir, how the subjects I explore in prose always begin in my poems. So today, I'm going to read a uh, brief selections from this new memoir in progress, primarily a Wampanoag piece and a, a fear uncertainty piece and a bit from a, a chapter um, called The Quiet People, along with um, three poems that relate to the memoir and preceded it. Before writing the memoir, um, Peace on the Wampanoags, I began, began thinking about my relative in uh, this poem, Swerve which was written on Thanksgiving. Um, the poem is in short lines of three to five words, and the relative that I mentioned was the last surviving Wampanoag in South Yarmouth, Massachusetts. Um, are, you, are you familiar with the Wampanoags? Is that a, do you, the tribe? I, I think most people know them as the, the Indians of the first Thanksgiving um, on Cape Cod, in, um, and they're also, they were also in Rhode Island. Swerve. I think of the man who sat behind my grandmother's sister in church and told her the percentage of Indian in her blood, calling it out over the white pews. I wonder what made him want to count it like coins or a grade. I wish I could hear him now when I think of her saying that all the Wampanoag blood in her body would fit in one finger, discounting the percentage it seemed. But why was she such a historian, tracing the genealogy of the last Wampanoag up to her own children, 
typing it all on see-through paper. Maybe like me, she felt a little self-conscious, caring about what we're made of, instead of simply being satisfied, dressing our bodies, and driving them around. Maybe she felt shy for loving someone she'd never met. I mean, I do. I think of the knife cutting into flesh and the fork carrying it to your mouth. I always think of that, the scythe-like movement, a single motion, a swerve. I think of my relative, the last Wampanoag in the town, walking the streets with a dollar that the town gave him. Even then, what would a dollar buy? A finger of land, if an Indian could have bought land. I think of walking into the almshouse, the alms falling like figs from trees, something to gnaw on. I think of the first time of thanks, before it had a name, when it was just some relatives of mine keeping some relatives of yours alive through a cold winter. People stupid enough to take food from a graveyard, food meant for the dead. In the Wampanoag piece I'm reading, um, the title, The Table of Perfect, is taken from James Lee Byer's Table of Perfect um, at MoMA. It's a 3,000 pound solid white marble cube covered with gold leaf. And it's shown in the center of an empty room to suggest an altar and a sacred space. Um, Byers considered himself a mystic, investigating ideas of eternity and transcendence through simple acts and forms. The selection I'm going to read is about midway through the piece, and the island I mention is Martha's Vineyard, which is where the piece takes place. There's an epigraph from Paul Eluard. There is another world, and it is this one, the table of perfect. On another island, it's raining. I've been looking for a relative who died two centuries ago, a Wampanoag who converted to Christianity and became a teacher, converted others. According to the newspaper, after the smallpox deaths, he was the last of the South Yarmouth Wampanoags, so the town took his land. He moved to the shores of a pond, but died in the almshouse. I found his pond, but had to trespass to walk into the water, pines lining the road, as if everything is entrance. I wanted to touch what he had touched, but it's a Boy Scout camp. I had to walk sideways on the hilly grass, around the signs. I had to look like I belonged. My relative lived across the water, not here on this island, but I don't know how to find him. I can't even find his grave. I want to know how he lived after everything was taken away. On this island, the tribe survived. A friend drives me to Christian town, land set aside for praying Indians in 1660. We turn down a dirt one lane into woods, all bright green, pine, the on again, off again rain, restive and calm, something happening in the trees. There it is. A shingled house appearing, white door, Mayhew Chapel. Gray leaks into the letters, the original church burned. This one built in 1828. My ancestor, still alive then, 81 years old. I descend from him through my grandmother, who married a Finn. You look Finnish, my friend says. I can see it. Maybe she means that with my blonde hair, blue eyes, I don't look Wampanoag. I'm thinking of the body divided into quadrants, humors, a quarter of my body Scandinavian. I think the stones we pass are graves, but they're just stones. Four thin bars cross the chapel door from top to bottom. Rust drips from the center bar's lock. Stone foundation, yellow flowers. <laughs> About 20 feet long, 15 across, the size of a garage or shed, but meant to hold 50 people. Glass windows on both sides. I can see the white pews inside. Here, the Wampanoags would quiz the teachers, ask them to explain mysteries in the Bible, have it make sense. 
It made me laugh, the building so small, they must have been packed inside the one room, peppering the minister with questions. How do we rise from the dead? Across the road from the chapel, a big stone with a metal plaque leads to a burial ground. My friend and I start walking in the high grass. I'm glad there aren't snakes in Massachusetts, I say. Ticks, she says, her bare feet and sandals. The grass is near my waist, no path at all. It's a field. Should we go on? And there's a sign that says, no. It says, boundary marker, access is restricted to tribal members only, except those with express written permission. My friend says, you are a tribal member. She's joking, of course, but it gets me to lift my foot. What portion of me is Wampanoag, that foot I'm lifting? This doesn't feel right, and I can't see anything but grass. I think I need permission. We turn around, back to the road. There's another path on the opposite side of the chapel, a U that leads us to a root cellar. I look inside, a stone hideout, empty and dark. It's raining again, and my friend is already back in the car, engine running. I'm wet, but I walk back to the front door of the chapel, stand on the heavy flat stone, and see a triangle of paper sticking out from the side of the door, like a note someone is passing to me. When I touch it, it folds out and open like a fan, but still wedged in the door. It's yellowed. Someone has written Pitut Yasif, and beneath this, come in. Take it, my friend yells, but I can't. I can't take anything from here. Hurriedly, I copy the message down on a scrap of paper, hoping I've got it right. In the car, my friend glances at the message from the door. Wouldn't it be something if it's finished, she says. It does look kind of Finnish. And later, when I try to decipher it, I see that P2 is Finnish, the name of a famous Finnish snowboarder and also of a Finnish DJ. I'm wondering if the second T is a plus sign, an and, and Yasef, another name. I thought I was being welcomed, come in, when all along it may have been two people, P2 and Yasef, who had been invited, who never arrived. But with the four locks, how could they have come inside? If they had opened the door, the note would have fallen to the ground. Before we'd left, I'd wanted to take pictures of the inside of the church, frustrated at the locks, and my friend said, just put your camera up to the window. And like magic, the inside appeared. Twelve white pews painted hymnal red on the top edges, the windows and, the, and on the other side shuttered, garnet carpet with little stars, wooden altar, lace edge, paint peeling from the ceiling above one window. It could be a room of gold leaves, all the people gone, the root cellar of nothingness in the woods. In the performance instructions for the installation of his death, James Lee Byers had written, quietly lie down and quietly get up. When I told someone I wanted to write my way into another world, he said, you're just banging your head against the glass. I don't know what else to do. An artist once told me about a house he photographed. He said it took a long time to know what to do with the house. After years, he scraped a rectangle on one wall down to white by the light socket. At first, all he did was look. Inside, the walls were kaleidoscope, triangles you can turn in your hands. In his photos, the grass is bright green, ringing like a phone I can't find. He tore all the walls down, every torn place smoothed. Night became the walls, plaster tired, so glad to stop holding everything up, the small white flowers departing. I could see the pink underneath like skin, like a body forgotten. The muscle can uncover the shoulder. The field can come in like an act of repair. The next piece I'm, I'm uh, reading is a selection from How to Live with Uncertainty. Um, but first, I'm going to read two short poems on similar uh, themes. Um, 
this first poem, Five Kingdoms, um, is concerned with uh, post-atomic fear, the idea of safety and what safety means. It's a non-narrative poem. It's composed mostly of questions. Um, it was written on the 60th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. And the title, Five Kingdoms, refers to the five kingdoms of life that categorize every living thing. The five kingdoms. What is the blue? What is the blue in the temperature drop? Is the stove doing its arithmetic so that heat is not just felt but seen? Do you know the whereabouts of the color photograph of a dog, tied tables, a car down below? What is the plan for your own and another's vital signs, the rose red yellow? If you drape the windows with seaweed, is that the simplest means for extinguishing the species? Do you keep all of your money under the bed because of the Cold War, because those now living lay down years ago? With the dropping of the first bomb, did our average age limit drop? If we place lucky objects, perform activities a special number of times, if we are ugly or disfigured in some way, and we diagnose our contact with live animals, broken glass, auto exhaust, garbage, grease and solvents, lead, can we forgive our impulse to rob, steal from, cheat, for causing harm to others, with our thoughts, training a blowtorch on hundreds of thousands until their skin came off like gloves, a child, a white flash running in the street. Recite the lucky numbers and the multiples. Collect and remove tacks, razor blades, nails, lit cigarettes. Touch them before using, before you break in two. Categorize the five kingdoms. Count all the living things. And the second poem, Crush, um, was also written in the same time period. There's an epigraph to the poem from 1964 um, from Mario Savio. There is a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part, and you've got to put your bodies upon the gears. Crush. We still go to the grocery. After dropping bombs on people who turned into shadows, actual silhouettes on walls where fire melted them, locomotive speed pressing, the body thinner than paper, a smudge, and the many who lived hurt, crush, 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 like Quinchin, the politician, crushed Agatha's breasts years ago, then cut them off. In the confusion of the Middle Ages, her breasts on a plate were mistaken for loaves of bread, and bread was blessed on the altar on the day of her feast, though she was rolled naked over lit coals and broken dishes, angels holding gold to her body, while men in bloody clothes pointed this way and that. Um, so the memoir piece, How to Live with Uncertainty, it's, it's composed of 16 sections. Uh, I'm not going to read um, all 16, but I, I'd like to read a few to give you a sense of the piece. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in reading it in full, um, it will be in uh, Plowshares this spring. How to Live with Uncertainty, two. In 1998, after my grandmother died, and I stood in her bedroom, my relative said, come out of there. He said, you're like me. I saw it and how open his eyes were, sleepless, but I turned away to take everything of hers that I could carry. Her clothes meant for the Cancer Society thrift shop, her quilts, a painting of Gloucester Harbor on the wall. I still have it all her slippers, sweaters, flight bag, diary. I carry them everywhere. When I stood in the Yarmouth post office, surrounded by her things, weeping, no box for her painting, the postman said, I like art. 
He took the painting from me, wrapping it like a body in rolls of brown paper, talking in a constant low tone, the spooling out something I could listen to. I don't know how to let her clothing go. I have no idea. Nothing can be worn. I tried, and it made the veins in my wrists hurt. Three. I saw her before she died, Mary of the violet eyes. Her mother hadn't wanted to go to the hospital either, their deaths preventable, but they sat in the house, endured. My father says I should be careful when I write about other people. I don't think he knows how careful I am. Mary with her open eyes too, her parents from Finland, I remember her brother, my grandfather, and his silence, the strongest man I've ever seen, and my mother, his child, her rules, the winters I watched from inside, the house I can't enter, her hundred years and more of worrying. And then the unblood related relative in Finland who went into the bedroom and stayed for seven years, unable to come out. The months I didn't want to move, blood slowing down, I thought, I wonder how bad this can get, as if my body was a dress I'd been fond of, taken off. Five, the New England Algonquins are buried, were buried with things. 94 round glass beads make a necklace for the baby. A spoon and bowl, two bells, small square bottle, three glass rosette buttons and a body, but no mention of age or gender, just a baby and a body to the right, about 18 inches apart. Why would the baby be apart? Why isn't the baby in the body's arms closer? If the baby will need a necklace in the next life, surely he, she will need to be held. Another body in another grave had hair eight to 12 inches long that fell away when the blanket was removed. A small kettle, head facing southeast. Another grave, 120 shark's teeth, nails, graves lined with matting and blanket. At home, I felt surrounded by things as if I were in a museum of my life. The photographs were the worst. I couldn't recognize myself anymore. Seven, after 9-11, I flew to New York a lot, the risk always orange. That winter, I tried to cut up photos of the man I loved and me. We looked so unhappy, but I'd only cut a corner when he stopped me, as if it were bad luck. Eight. When a woman is arrested in Miami, held against the police car, I heard her say, someone has stolen her eyes and she must get back to ancient Rome. The cop says, relax. But CNN does erase her eyes, her face fuzzed out for anonymity, nowhere to look. 13. When I had to leave someone in trouble, when the decision to abandon him demented me, my friend said, you've given yourself too big a part to play, cradling a delicate neck, as if I could be a sea, a house, bed, mattress, an umbrella, the cars rushing by in the night, the night, shoes, letters to be named, nursery and coastal town. It's a familiar feeling this awful adrenaline upset. But when there was difficulty, he told me the moon knew about it long ago. 15, I was fever sick in the basement of a strange house in a new city. I knew he'd be here soon. He was running toward the room I was in. He wouldn't know I was his mother. It was as if he'd lived, been raised by others, and I'd just come to visit. I worried I wouldn't know what to do or say. He came from the right, around the corner, still running, two years old or three, a little older than when he died. I reached out my arms and he was in them. I lifted him up and he let me the way a small child does the center of my body opening, deepening to a place beyond my body, making room for him. 
He'd been eating crackers in another room. I found an oval cracker in my hand and held it to his mouth the way I'd held a bottle the day he was born. He hadn't been hungry then. This time it took a moment, but he ate. He was so light to carry, but real, a real boy. He had that same lightness when he was born, weight, part of it, though really something else. He was, it was around us too, and us. My left arm still holds the warmth of him, where his back rested against my skin. Thirty years since I last held him, but just today he was in my arms, never sick. He'd never been sick. 16. Exposure is part of the cure. If you have a fear of your house burning down, you watch it go down. If you have a fear of stabbing yourself to death, you open yourself to the knife. I have a fear of numbers, of money, the account empty, the way it disappeared once and now that bell keeps ringing, low bawling when I could have my hands deep in the abacus, that clarity. It's the disappearance of you that most concerns me, that I think may break me in two. How do I expose myself to this? My own disappearance, brain a slew, some distance behind. I've tried looking at an empty yellow field. When the thought comes that I can save you with a prayer, I think it's then that I have to let go. Not to imagine the world without you. I'm not capable of that. I have to let go of the fear of your leaving, the possibility, and my complicated net to save you. Once in a meeting, I sat in a chair in a crowded room, wondering why I was there, antsy, not like the early days. I could stay. It was more that I was still more in the outside world. The group of chairs on my side of the room faced the main hall, people in the chairs before me facing front, profiled. A girl sitting in the back of the room leaned her chair against the wall, tipped it back. I'd never seen her before. She said that we're loved more than we can know. I think of that almost every day. When I'm terrified that someone might come to harm, I think of her leaning back, her ease. I think that no matter how much I love someone, how tight my fear to keep them safe, everyone is loved more than I can know. Each person a flame I stare into. And I don't have a poem before this piece, but this is The Quiet People. It's just um, a, a piece from the beginning and a piece from near the end. While I'd been living in a glass cabin in December, a man with a Russian accent had startled me in bed near midnight. I was alone in the woods, reading about 300 students who place flowers on a poet's monument in Warsaw in 1968. They were beaten with clubs. The flowers were beaten. I read about the secret police watching a conversation with a radio. If you wanted to get the news, you could stop in Vienna. You could listen anywhere. The waves of news. In bed, my phone rang, and when I said hello, the man with the Russian accent didn't speak at first, then stammered, said, sorry, hung up. He called back. I let it ring. He didn't leave a message. I thought of calling him back to ask where he was calling from, the country and the year. I wanted to know where I'd gone, where my voice had been heard. My mother's family does come from near Russia, on the border with Finland. Overrun, they'd had to leave during the war. One relative came home to find the church bell buried in the garden. The king of Sweden adopted him because of his athletic ability. But when he was older, a ski instructor, he married an even older woman who thought she'd be childless all her life. They had children, they worked. One day my relative went into the bedroom for seven years. 
he wouldn't come out. He slept like Sleeping Beauty, his wife raising the children, cooking, working. After seven years, he walked out of the bedroom. Nearby, on the side of the road, are the quiet people, even quieter than my sleeping relative. They don't even breathe. A field of people made of sticks and straw. In winter, most wear coats, some with pajamas. They sleep standing up, dress eclectic, but they all wear snow and face the same direction, waiting patiently for someone to appear. Thank you. Yeah, if you, if you have any questions, yes. Um, well, this, these all began as, um, as, as poems first, um, and it's just, uh, it could be start as an image or just something that I, um, well, it, actually always, it's always something that I can't turn away from. Um, my best time to write is probably from about uh, 10 at night to about, um, depending, 10 to 2 or, or 10 to 4 in the morning. Um, and then to wake up the next day and to, to have that, to, to revise. Um, I revise not during that time period, but just to generate um, late at night and then revision during the day. Oh, so you do it a bit later. Right, okay. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's, it's various elements. So one of them is just the basic genealogical search. Um, uh, so I have uh, Wampanoag, Finnish, and Irish, um, uh, all of them very difficult to find. But, um, but through uh, various databases, I'm able to find things like um, the uh, World War I draft card for my great-grandfather, which has the only written reference to my great-grandmother from Ireland on it um, in the U.S., which is uh, wife. So, uh, um, so that, that was the, the first um, part of it. And then because the, the people that I'm looking for are so, my relatives are so difficult to find, I've been looking at um, their lives in context. So by looking at um, oral histories, um, diaries of other uh, Finns who have immigrated or Irish who have immigrated. Um, um, what was it like in Yarmouth, Massachusetts in um, 1750? Um, so there's that. And then there's also research on um, the culture of fear. Um, so I'm interested in, in uh, everything from the, the science of fear, um, uh, uh, well, actually everything that I can find on it. Um, uh, and I've been collecting material um, to bring with me. So I'm not photographs um, of uh, you know, poor sections of Cork City um, uh, that I've uh, been able to find here uh, at the library. Um, and I'm hoping that just bringing this mass of material with me to the University of Nevada, um, where basically I'm secluded in a concrete <laughs> dorm for five months, uh, in Las Vegas, um, that something will spark, that connections will be made. That I, I, with memoir, I think that it has to be, well, with memoir and with poetry, that it has to be about discovery. Um, so I know here are these elements that I'm interested in, but where it's going to go is really the story that I'm writing. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.